まあ My name is Cameron Buckner, and this is the Dixie Cryptid Podcast, also known as the What If It's True Podcast, out on the podcast network. This is a bonus episode with me not in it. I'm not narrating any stories or doing any live reads or a live stream. I'm going to share with you an episode from a podcast that I really enjoy called Sasquatch Odyssey. The host of the podcast, his name is Brian King Sharp. He's actually had me on his show for an interview. We had a great time. That was a few months ago. Brian also hosts two other podcasts. One is called Paranormal Odyssey, and the other is True Crime Odyssey, which I've been listening to lately, and I found it very interesting. So what you're about to hear is an episode from Sasquatch Odyssey. In the description below, there'll be a link to his website where you can go and find all of these podcasts and see where they're listed. Or with your podcast app, just do a search for any of the names that you'll see scrolling across the screen. I hope you guys enjoy this. This is an interview with a gentleman that uh, I think is gonna, I think is gonna blow you away. And Brian also narrates stories, and the last half of this podcast will be Brian's rendition of narrating some stories. So I hope you all enjoy this, and hope you're having a good weekend. And we'll see you guys early next week. Right now, let's listen to an episode of Sasquatch Odyssey. Dave comes to us from Missouri. He's had multiple experiences with Sasquatch out there in Missouri. So glad to have you on the show to share your experiences with us tonight, Dave. Thanks so much for being here, man. It's good to be here. So why don't you just sort of walk us into the very first encounter that you ever had, what you were doing, what happened. Just take it away, man. Okay, well, I moved here from South Dakota in May in 2007. And there have been some different oddball things happening that you couldn't really explain and and it's like, my God, the coyote howling was unreal. My first encounter was April 2nd of 2012. The previous day, I had been out in this stand of trees, cutting down a whole bunch of these dead ones that I didn't have to split and cutting them up for firewood. I figured instead of just let it rot, I just, well, you know, save a little on the heat bill. I went out to pick up what I had cut the day before. And the way my property is, I live on 10 acres, and it's kind of, the hill is like a finger of land, and the house and the barn are on that. And I was in my pickup, of course, to go pick up the wood. And I went around the barn, and then kind of on the top of the hill at the far end, I kind of made like a cul-de-sac where you could turn around. As I'm doing that, I get up there, and right by the edge of the forest, I see a dark figure standing there. And I'm like, no, no. No way. No effing way. You know? <laughs> and as I started to do my little turnaround, I kind of had to look away for a second. I've got a few trees growing here I need to destroy. These locust trees, and they got these horrific thorns that will give you a flat tire if you run one over. I avoided missing that. I looked back, and it was gone. Now, from my perspective of in the truck with the dirty windshield and everything, it appeared to be about man size. I guess the best way I would describe it is it was a dark figure standing there. Kind of like if you take one of those silhouette pistol targets of a person and take all the numbers and lines out of it, it was about that color and everything. It was just dark. Now, I didn't see any facial features, so its back may have been towards. You know, I turned back and it was gone. Well, the place I had to park to grab my wood was only about 100 feet away. So I'm here to tell you what. I looked over my shoulder a lot as I'm gathering up this wood. So I only grabbed about half of what I was going to and called it good enough. Now, two days later, I went back and went to where the figure was standing and realized that the way the hill sloped there, that it was a little taller than what I had first thought it to be. I thought it was about six foot tall like a man, but no, this had been eight feet tall. And I'm thinking it was an adult female because it didn't have the huge burly wide shoulder. So I went and I looked for tracks, but in a hardwood forest with all the leaf litter, there wasn't nothing to find. 
you know, if they're half dead or something, you got to find them when they're fresh because it's like, kind of imagine stepping on a sponge and then putting the sponge in slow motion. That's what the forest for. I thought, well, okay, now what do I do? I reported it. I called the sheriff's department and said, you know, who do I report this to? Like the conservation officer? I talked to him and he said, well, they're not a protected species, so if you see it again, just shoot it in the face. I said, what's wrong with you? I said, it didn't threaten me. It wasn't doing nothing. It was just there. So I did some calling around, and I hooked up with the Sasquatch Research Organization out of around Minneapolis. And I made a report and whatnot, and they sent some guy to do an investigation for them because he was out of Kansas City, so it was close. I'm not going to mention his name, but it didn't turn out real well. And after that, it was probably about a week later, after dark, I let my dogs out, and Boomer the Coonhound jumped the fence. And this was about midnight, so Rascal and I came in the house, and pretty soon there was Boomer at the front door, ready to come in. I let him in, he stopped, and he had a smell to him, and, and it was from a Bigfoot petting him. And I came to realize that it was an adult male that had been petting him because it had the way the smell was is think of a sweaty horse, burnt smoke balls with a skunk undertone. And it's like, oh, great. I really didn't feel like giving him a bath at that time of night, you know, about 1230. But since he's the one that likes to sleep in my bed with me, I didn't have much choice. Then about a week later, I was a little further down the hill from where I had that original site. And, you know, you buy a place in the country, you you inherit a lot of old junk. Well, there was a lot of old wood and plastic and stuff where they'd been dumping below the face of the dam. So I took a burn barrel down there, and I was throwing briars and all kinds of stuff in there. And, you know, you burn it up, at least you reduce the mass of it, right? And I'm down there, and... About 75 yards away, I hear something moving towards, and I couldn't get a good look at it. This was, you know, like the third week of April. The leaves weren't really all bushed out yet, and the forest here is really thick. But I could see there was something black, and I heard it, you know, come towards me, and it was behind this clump of oak trees that were probably about a foot around, about seven of them in the clump. And I'm doing my thing, and I'm burning, and pretty soon something lands about 20 feet away from me. I don't know if it was a a nut from a tree, a rock, who knows. I didn't see it, but I kind of laughed, and I said, it's okay. You don't have to be afraid of me. I said, I won't hurt you, and I'm doing my burning, and oh, let me back up on it. I was down there burning, and I heard from the west up the hill, Six wood knocks right in a row. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then it moved forward. And I'm burning. And pretty soon I hear something else come and it goes like a rock and it hit a piece of tin and it goes ping. I said, Well, come on out. I'm not going to hurt you. Come say hi. And, you know, it was just kind of there and everything was all good. And then, kind of from the north and to the east, I heard it sound like a blind elephant walking along the tree. I thought, you know, one of these things, okay. But now there's the second one. So when you were down there doing the burning and and you mentioned something was either a rock or something fell out of a tree. No, it was thrown. You think it was thrown? Because there was something about 75 feet away hiding behind this big clump and it was black. And the last time I checked, I don't think bears throw anything. And We don't have any bears around here, and the hillbillies shoot all the mountain lions, so what else could it be? But then when there was this second one, and there was a lot of branches and stuff getting broken, in my mind, I thought, kind of reminded me of how, like, when rival clans of chimpanzees encounter each other, how they put on the show and they break the branches and everything, because rather than have a conflict, they'd rather just have the other guy leave, you know, the other bunch of them go. You know, it wasn't one of my more braver moments. But I thought, well, you know what? If there's two of them, this might be a good time to just say, it's time to go up to the house and get a nice cool drink. Then, about a week later, 
I had what was not such a pleasant encounter. It was probably about 10 o'clock at night. I was out on the front porch, which is open along the whole front of the house, and I could smell one, so he was pretty damn cold. And I walked over to the end of the porch, and I, I tried talking to him. And it's like, can we live in peace? I said, I don't want to hurt you, and I don't want you to hurt me. I just want to be able to get along. And he blasted me hard with infrasound. Now, I don't know if there's a telepathic component to it or not, but the way it felt, it was like anger and fear, hatred and doom all rolled into one directed at me. And I physically shuddered. Was it like a yell? Of- I didn't hear nothing, but I felt okay. And he hit me with it a second time. And I said, well, you know what? I'm going inside. That's enough of that. It left me pretty rattled. I mean, I, I didn't sleep at all that night. And I was in the recliner with my Mini 14 and a 40-round mag in it, sitting across my lap and my 357 right there, too. Because I thought, you know, this thing wants to try and come in. I'm going to do whatever I got to do to be the one that lives, you know? So that's kind of how it started. And then I figured out, that the females were doing these barred owl-like calls. So, you know, I kind of took an approach of, like, Jane Goodall, in a way. You think, what would it be like if you landed on a planet with an indigenous population? How would you communicate with them? So I kind of tried mimicking their calls, only with I do a four-toot whistle. And they would call back. But see, it was different enough that they could identify it as being me and not someone trying to trick them. You know, you look at all these shows, and all they want to do is use these methods of trickery. That's all the BFRO did on Finding Bigfoot. It was always trying to trick them, always trying to trick them. Well, once they realize what's going on, nobody wants to be made a fool of, and then they don't want nothing to do with it. So I started doing that, and once in a while I'd put out some food for them, And I used to have this billy goat, and I figure they're watching all the time. You know, I'd call out to him, I'd yell to him, and I'd yell out, are you hungry? And he'd come running like crazy, and I'd put his food down, and he'd eat. And if they're watching, you know, they might figure it out. So I went back down to that spot where I had been burning, and I'd yell out into the hollows, are you hungry? Really loud. And I'd take my shovel and hit the burn barrel a couple of times. And I had the, there was this big oak log laying there and they would, I'd put like a, I don't know, like a Denny Moore beef stew can with some stuff in it there. And it'd always be gone. But you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that they took it, but something did. But anyway, we'll get back to the SRA. After that other guy in that fiasco, they sent this guy down named Chris. When he got there, I met him partway up the road and showed him where I had had a good visual of an adult male. And he went and stood where the adult male was. Now, when I had seen him, he was on all fours, and I spotlighted him. And I'll tell you what, God, you're big. Chris was standing there, and Chris is a big boy. He's at least six foot. He goes, well, how big was he? I said, if he leaned down a little bit, he could touch his chin on top of your head when he was on all fours. I mean, we're talking, he had to be, I'm going to say, no less than 1,200 pounds, maybe more. And then we get up to the house, and I, I, I said to Chris, I said, well, I'm going to run the truck down there and call to him and stuff and see if we can get a little response. So I go down there, and I, I do my call and smack the burn barrel with shovel a couple of times, drive up to the house. He goes, oh, I could really hear you. you got a set of pipes on you. And then we heard a wood knock, nice crisp one. And then he kind of looked at me a little bit, you know. And then about three minutes later, we heard that shovel hit the burn barrel three times. And he, he kind of looks at me like, are you putting me on? I said, no, we just do stuff different here and we get results. There had been a lot of that in different exchanges. And then one night when I, most of what I record and stuff I do from my deck because I got a crippled up leg, and I don't get around so good. I can't run or nothing. So I'd go out at night, out on the deck, and 
they'd line up on the ridge just east of my house, about 100 feet apart. There were three females that would return my call. And this one night, I could hear some bipedal footsteps coming towards me. And there's like an old, like about a 53-something old car that they just pushed down into the bottom. And I could hear like a footstep on top of the hood. You hear it go crinkle. And then you can kind of hear a couple of really light steps and then nothing. And then I heard what sounded like a foot pivoting. You know, like when you do a 90-degree turn and the gravel makes that pivot sound. I heard that. And then see the the house blocks out the yard light on that side, so you're pretty much in the dark. But I caught a glimpse of him, and he was pretty broad across the shoulders, about six feet tall. And he was standing there in my driveway. Because he's only 15 feet away. And it's like, oh, God, now what do I do? <laughs> All I can hear is my heart beat my ears, you know, because it's pretty intense. And we're kind of new at getting used to each other. And I thought, oh, yeah, I went to the dollar store and bought one of them, like, 10 packs of Tootsie Pop. And it was right inside the door. So I grabbed that. And you never seen anybody peeling them Tootsie Pops as fast as you like. And I'm peeling them, and I'm chucking them over the fence to him. I heard a couple of them go thud when they hit him. <laughs> so I threw the whole bunch of them, and then I called Richard, who'd been kind of mentoring me. And I said, Richard, I got one right here. He's like 15 feet away. What do I do? He goes, well, sit down and see if he comes to you. And I went, you know, and I, I was out of Tootsie Pops. So I sat down and then my stupid phone was one of them, you know, straight talk Walmart phones dropped the call. So poor old Richard probably thinks I got got. Well, he got a mouthful of Tootsie Pops and he went back to mom and the other girl. And I called Richard back, you know, and said, no, I didn't get got. And just phone dropped the call. I said, he went back the way he came. But now as far as what they look like in the face, they are very, very, very similar to the Patterson Gimlin, the Patty. They're black. They've got gray skin, green glowing eyes. But the facial features are, are very much like the Patty. But now here, they're really shaggy. And they got a good thick gob of hair on their head. It kind of reminds you of being like a string mop, kind of stringy like that. And they cut their bang. Now, what? What they use to cut their bangs, who knows? Could be a piece of broken glass would work for that. But their bangs are cut. Like I said, they're very shaggy. The males, the hair kind of goes down their back like a mane, down to a point. Stops, you know, about a little bit below the shoulder blade. And, yeah, they're extremely, the males are extremely wide. Now, if you see a female that's about five foot tall, She'd look like a, a kid, but with wide shoulders. They're kind of scrawny at that age. You've said several times that you could tell the, the different vocalizations were female and obviously male. Just for the audience, I, I got to ask, are you assuming that, or you've actually gotten close enough to see the genitalia to know the difference in the two? Well, I know which ones are the females, and I know which ones are the males, because the males, the adult males, they travel with coyotes. They've got them domesticated. And each one will have like five coyotes. And they're a lot more lower voice than they howl like a werewolf and get the coyotes going. Now, the reason the females use the owl calls is because the adolescent males act as guards. Over. And in a thick forest, the guards position themselves to watch over the female. And it also lets them know who's who and where without a direct line of sight. Because each one does a little bit different. Now, you know, owls, they're a solitary hunter. If they got a nest, one's going to be on the nest, the other one's going to what? Be out hunt. You're not going to have three of them. And they're also very territorial. They don't travel like, you know, gorillas, they'll travel all right together. Not the Bigfoot. You'll have a mother and, and her dependent child, but then they're going to be at least 100 feet apart. And then the juvenile males are spread further out than that, so they can and act as guards, so, because that's their job. How many of that's these things do you think you have around your property there? Pretty close to 20. 
There's six adult males. There's four juvenile males. There's five breeding age females and some little ones, I would imagine. Are those the only encounters you've had? Have you gotten even closer to these things? This has clearly been going on for quite a while. So what else has happened out there? Well, here's a good story. My boy Ralph and I, we went grocery shopping and we heard him. And when we come back, I get out of my truck and I could hear one right right there. It kind of startled me a little bit. And he was carrying in groceries and, and I, I kind of was helping a little. And I made a sandwich because she was over by these hickory trees. And for those that don't know, a hickory tree's got leaves like a rubber tree plant. So it's kind of hard to see through. I was out there and I had been exchanging calls with her for about 20 minutes. I mean, they watch over my house when I'm gone. and. I wanted to coax her out from cover to get a better look at her. Because, you know, you could see like maybe one eye and part of the face. But I was trying to lure her out and I got my arm out and, oh, I'm I'm just talking. Well, come on, baby. Come here, sweetheart. Are you hungry? You know, you want something to eat? You know, sweet talking her to the best of my ability, trying to get her to come out. Well, I was able to get within seven feet of her before she retreated. And one night I walked out into the kitchen. I've got like a trash can that I put the bags of dog food in, and then I got a big scoop. So that I was going to put a scoop of food in a dog's dish. And I looked, and there was one right outside the window. I could see his green eyes glowing and his face up close. And I had to look up at him a little, and I was, you know, he was probably about a nine footer. And, you know, once he realized that he'd been seen, then he just kind of turned left and was gone into the dark. The obvious question for for me and probably some of the folks that are listening, have you been able to catch these things on video? Have you been able to take pictures of them? Gotten a couple pictures. They're not very good because of the distance. Kind of dumb luck because I didn't realize they were there at the time. But like here, when the forest leaves out, like about the first week of May, you're lucky to see 25 to 50 foot. There's just that much leaf. It's pretty dense. And usually when you see them, they uh, go away from you. So even if you got a camera or whatever, it might be kind of hard to get a picture. Talk to people who've had camera in their hand and didn't take a picture because they were too awestruck by what they were seeing. I've definitely heard those stories too. So Dave, why do you think these things are hanging around your property and interacting with you on this level? Do you think there's something more to it? Do you think there's something more to them? There's a couple of different camps out there that believe these things are just a giant ape that had been undiscovered and it's running around in the woods. And then there's some people that are more kind of woo-woo that think they're aliens that are dropped out of UFOs. And then there's the people that think there's something in between and there's mind speak and and all these other things. What is your theory? You've had these interactions and you've had these very close encounters. What do you think is the reason that they're hanging around and the the reason that they're interacting with you on this level? Well, I'm an empath and I think they can read me. Plus, where they seem to bed down is not real far away. And the fact that I reached out to them and I've shown them nothing but kindness and they like me. They like the attention. You know, most of my interaction is with the female. And it seems like with a lot of the people I've talked to that are having ongoing interaction, it's usually with one of the opposite sex, for whatever reason. I've heard similar stories. It's almost like a habituation site where they have access to food if you're giving them food and candy and things like that to bring them in. I mean, it sounds like you guys have developed some sort of a relationship over the years, so. Well, the thing is, with them here, I'd I'd much rather have them be my friends than worried if you step out the door, you're going to get ambushed. Yeah, because that's the other side of the coin, is I've heard tons and tons of encounters that aren't anywhere near the type of encounters that you're describing. I mean, people have claimed these things have attacked them physically, they've attacked their camper trailers, they've attacked their homes, they've attacked their vehicles. And I, I frankly, I'm in the camp that I think, you know, people have probably been killed by these things over their history. So it's just fascinating to me that you're having all these interactions with this many individuals. One time, while I was heading out in the dark, and to show them that I trust them, I don't carry a gun, I don't carry a light, I walk out there in the pitch dark, 
at my most vulnerable to show them that I trust that they won't harm me. And I was calling to the females and I was getting out by my barn and I got a post out there where I'll set like a coffee can with some dog food and a couple of eggs and a couple strips of bacon and they're happy. Well, I got by this open bay and from inside the barn, I heard this growl. It sounded like a cross between a St. Bernard and a bear or something from up by the ceiling. And it's like, oh God, you ever had one of them oh shit moments? This was it. And think fast, think fast, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? And so I turned my back to him because the reason he growled is because he felt trapped. I was in front of the opening to the barn there, and he felt a little bit trapped. That's why he growled. So I just turned my back to him, went on about my business, you know, yelling to the other ones and put the food out and turned around and started heading towards the house. Well, I'll admit, Along that side of the barn, I walked a little faster than normal. I quickened my pace, but after that, it was all fun. You know, not a big deal. Now, my son's had some pretty funny encounters. They like to pick him off with pebbles. They've never hit me with it, but they've picked him off. And like when he first comes to live with me for a while, he's doing something that I wish he wouldn't have done. He was dragging all kinds of metal crap out of the burn pile wanting to recycle it. And it's like, no, you don't make a big mess. Leave all that crap where it was. But apparently there was one that threw a piece of, it looked like a a drop of aluminum, you know, like aluminum that had been burned and got hot, about a big around as a quarter and probably three times as thick. And he thought I did. So he comes in, sees me, said that he kept that, but it picked him off. And there was another time I got my truck stuck even with the four-wheel drive, because all the treads got filled up with mud. And he goes, I'll just go to the house. I'll dig it out a little bit, and I'll be out shortly. So he's got my shovel, and he's digging out behind the tire. So figures if I can get a decent run at it and get forward motion to be able to get out of it. So he's doing it. He's been over digging. And I guess from out of the woods, there was this spring. You know the old-time box spring for a bed? How they'd have those tight wound springs about as big around as your finger. Well, one of them comes sailing out of the woods and picked him off right in the crack of the butt. And he goes, ow! And he heard a giggle come from the foot. Now, he's not as brave as I am. And they, they like to mess with him. So you've had all these experiences out there, Dave. You've had these very close encounters. And you've had an opportunity to think about this, obviously, for, for quite a while. What do you think these things are? They're people. They're just different. You know, when people talk about what they are and want to call them an ape, it's like, well, you obviously haven't had enough experience around them to understand. I mean, the pure complexity of just the way they move around and everything, they're highly intelligent, highly. And that's why we haven't caught one. So do you think they're intelligent enough to have a language of their own? Have you heard anything vocalization-wise that would lead you to believe that they're communicating in some sort of a language? Yes, and they can understand English as well. So you do believe they're able to understand English when you speak? Yeah. Now, here's an example. Uh, The starter went out on my truck, and I called my neighbor, and I said, yeah, you're going to be in town tomorrow. Could you pick me up a starter, get to the auto parts store, and then uh, just call me, and I'll give them my credit card information and pay for it? And then get it for me. He said, yeah, sure. I said, now I got the the core. I said, well, what do you want me to do with it so that you got it? What vehicle you drive? And he said, oh, I'll be driving the pickup. He goes, just, he said the topper in the back, is, it's not locked. Just set it inside. Okay. So I'm walking down the road, which is a very far to the neighbors. And along the tree line to the south, I can hear the big males and they're getting the coyotes kind of going trying to intimidate a little bit. Well, I get down to the neighbors. I put the seal in the back, and I'm coming back, and and they're doing that. And I, I just looked over at him, and I said, I just had to bring something over next door. I'm going home and going inside. All the coyotes yipping, yapping, everything, it just shut off immediately. I don't know. I guess they must have understood. They didn't feel the need to try and, you know, intimidate. That's definitely an interesting theory. I've heard people that 
have heard the the samurai chatter from the Sierra sounds, but I've never heard anybody say or really believe that they can speak or understand English. I think think it's a very interesting theory. Well, my boy used to catch them peeking in the window when he was watching TV. They were watching TV too, so I could see where they could pick it up off of that. You know, maybe they can't. I don't know how well they would speak it, but if they understand, isn't that good enough? Well, that's true. I think most animals, people who have dogs and things like that, dogs eventually understand different commands. I guess it could be said that they understand English. When you tell them to come, they come. When you tell them to sit, they sit. So I can certainly understand how that would be the case for some highly functioning being like a like a Sasquatch. Or I don't think that's too far off from reality. Now, the alien connection, I think, is a bunch of garbage. And this is why. There was, what, one encounter people had where they said a Bigfoot came out of a alien craft, and it walked right by him like it didn't even see him. Well, it doesn't pretty reminiscent of an alien abduction with a human being. I think they're just another number on the aliens list of doing whatever experimentation they're doing. I don't think there's any, any significant connection in it other than that, myself. Clearly, nobody really knows. So, I mean, your theory is just as valid as anybody else's. Let me ask you this. I've, I've asked people in the past, and I've heard other people during interviews, and just about every scenario where I've ever heard of like a habituation site or these things are hanging around a, a person's property on a regular basis, I always hear people talk about lights and seeing orbs of light. Have you had any experience with anything outside of Sasquatch, like the orbs or, or seeing lights around your property? Yeah. Well, tell us about that. Okay. On two separate occasions, I've seen white orbs high up in the tree. They didn't move. But the thing about it was it was extremely bright white, but it did not radiate any light from it. You know, you look at the moon, it radiates light. These did not radiate light. It was a nice crisp bed, lasted a couple seconds, and was gone. Now, I've seen something else. I had a friend here one time, and he pointed up in the sky and he says, what the heck is that? And it kind of had a greenish hue to it, like a glow stick. And it was up in the sky, you know, at night up in the sky. Who knows how big it was or how far away it was with any accuracy. But the thing about it that got me was it didn't move like a crab. It moved like a living creature. The way it moved kind of reminded me either like a jellyfish or like someone doing the backstroke. When you do the backstroke, you got that power thrust, and then when you're swinging your arms back around again, it's kind of more stationary, and then you get that power stroke. I've seen that twice. The first time it was, I think, July, and the second time it was only like 23 degrees outside, so it wasn't no bug. How big were the orbs that you saw in the tree? Probably about the size of a volleyball. That's fascinating, man. It's almost without fail when I hear about when the Sasquatch are sort of concentrated around a property and either that or some sort of habituation site, almost without fail, the property owner or people around the property see these <laughs> lights and these orbs. Do you think there's a correlation with the orbs and the Sasquatch or do you just think it's some sort of a weird coincidence that those things are happening, not necessarily simultaneously, but alongside each other? Well... The only time I've seen the orbs is when there were Bigfoot out there and I was interacting. Energy lives on forever in a way, doesn't it? The one thing that ties every paranormal subject together is these orbs. Whether it's your food biters, your will of the wisp, you know, other things like crop circles, they find orbs. There was that one film in England where it basically showed it looked like the orb made the crop circle thing. Remember seeing that? You know, just like with ghosts, they find orbs in the camera. Some of it can be dust, some of it can be bugs, some of it's other stuff. Who's going to say for sure, you know? Unless you had one to examine and take apart and see just what it is, because you haven't heard the best of the story. Well, we've got time. Um, go ahead and go ahead and tell me the best of the stories. All right. My old buddy Mike from... Uh, Pennsylvania came for a visit. We hadn't seen each other in a long time. He thought the watching thing was kind of neat. 
it's getting towards dark. I put some food out, you know, to try and draw the females in. And then we started hearing the male sound off with the coyote. Now, each one of these male hunters has five coyotes, and they're domesticated. And they were positioned in such a manner that they were probably an eighth of a mile out from us. But it was just like if you had a pie and where the slice mark is, it was like that. They were that strategically positioned. I had a friend come out here. I told him if he wanted to hunt some turkeys that there were a few. And he come out, and he was going to try and get ahead of them by the west side of my property. And he goes down there, and at first he said, I heard this really long whistle. It was like three breaths long. He goes, that was probably 75 yards to the west of me. Then I heard, a, heard it again, answered it back about 75 yards to the east. He goes, when I looked, he goes, I seen five coyotes. He goes, they were all right in the line, which is just not normal. And he goes, and one of them didn't have a tail. He goes, it might have been a dog. But he goes, they usually got that big bushy tail, kind of like a fox does. And he goes, the one didn't have that, didn't have a tail. And he said, so after that, I kind of got this uneasy feeling. And I decided it was best just to get the heck out of it. Now, I remember one time I let my dogs out. I had my spotlight. They run to the corner of the pen. And they're wagging. And then I heard a stick crunch. And I shined the spotlight. And it was a young male Bigfoot. We call him Little Andy. And he was on all fours, kind of looking back at me. When I hit him with the spotlight, oh, geez, he looked like a demon. Because the eye shine was so intense. It come out of his eye and obscured his facial features. You know, like in the vampire movies when they put a stake in one and the fire comes shooting out the eyeballs? Stein was like that. And then he stood up so he wouldn't get directly hit in the eye. And i lower it, and then he'd go back on all fours, and I'd raise it up again, and then he'd stand up again. He made friends with my dog. Not trying to kill him, but he made friends. Now, when my, my Marine buddy Mike was out here visiting, and they were all going off like that, I said, now, you know, we got to go. There's one on each side of the hill we got to walk between to get to the house with a young juvenile. He's going, I've been in the woods all my life, and I ain't never heard nothing like that. If it was me, I'd shoot someone in coyotes. I said, I ain't going to do that. If I shoot their coyotes, they'll kill my dog. But it's not how we get along. And he's going on and on. I said, Mike, it's like deer hunt. Got to be quiet. I said, I want to hear them that we got to walk between to get to the house, and all I can hear is your mouth. And he's going on and on. I'm like, hush, shut up. Will you be quiet? And finally, I just said to him, I said, you just like a little boat motor. Put, 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 put. So if you don't shut up, I'm going to bust you right in the head as hard as I possibly can. Then he finally shut up. But I'll tell you, at that point, he, he was done. He didn't want to go squat. That sounds pretty intense. Now, they've come in the house before when I'm gone. One time I had uh, bought one of those boneless turkey breast and had the deli slice it all up for me and put it in three packages. I had one of them sitting out on the counter waiting to thaw, you know, thaw it out so I'd have sandwiches. I went somewhere and I come home and it was gone. My dogs didn't do it. There wasn't any remnants of paper or, you know, the cellophane, you know, like the handy wrap stuff in there. It was just gone. Later, I found it on the hill to the east you know, one time they tried coming in the kitchen door, and they hadn't quite figured out how to turn the doorknob yet, and the doorknob was crushed. And it was to the point where I had to take the doorknob apart to let the dogs out to go potty. And then my boy Ralph was sitting at the computer, and he, he heard the door pop at this one night because it took us a couple of days to get the lumber yard to get another door. And he said he looked over because I didn't see nothing. Then all of a sudden, there was this black finger reached through the door where the doorknob was, hooked on there and pulled it shut. Well, I suppose he was out there on the porch swiping the kitty spoon. He used to feed the cat gravy train like it did the dog. Now, I've had, over the years, I've had four deer stolen from me by them. And this one, we call him Little Andy. He's the juvenile male that hangs out most of the time. And I've been following you know, seeing him grow since he was six feet tall. Now, the average adult male here is full 12 feet tall. 
most people, when it comes to Bigfoot, they really don't know anything. If they're thinking that that adult male is 12 feet or adult female is 8, I came up with a pretty good, accurate formula for determining the height of a Bigfoot from its footprint. Based on observation first, you know, where you could measure the height and a corresponding footprint go. And it's really simple. You take the number of inches and divide it by two, and it will give you the height. A female will have a narrower heel, and they'll stop out at about 16 inches. A male, his will be 24 inches. Now, the way that I came up with this formula was I went with little Andy, who was, when I first encountered him, like six feet tall. An adult male is 12 feet tall. Well, an adult human that's around six feet tall, human male child that's about five years old is three feet tall, right? Now, from the age of where they're like six feet tall, and I can only say this on the males because that's what I see more of than the female. They usually stay back. They're very protective of their young. But given that, over the years, he grows about six inches a year. So if you figure he was five, he would reach maturity at 12 feet at 17. It sounds pretty reasonable, doesn't it? Yeah, I would say that's a pretty reasonable assumption. And I've never heard that divide the footprint inches by two, and that'll give you the size of the height. And it's very accurate. But you got, you know, people want to say, well, the primate formula is blah, 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 and it's all off. Because most of your primates don't have a foot like ours. Most of your primates are tree dwellers, at least to some extent. They've got more like four hands rather than two hands and two feet. So that's why they don't fall into that, quote, quote, primate for me. Well, you've definitely got some interesting things going on there, and you've got some interesting theories, Dave. Like I said, man, I really appreciate you. We'll have to have you back for a, a round two. Keep me posted of anything else that, that happens out there, any of your audio or any of the pictures or video that you have. If you'd send it to me, I'd love to uh, throw it up on the side under this episode. I appreciate you very much for coming on the show. Now, have I sent you the pictures that I took? No, I haven't seen any pictures. Okay, because I only got two that made the cut. Now, one might have them doing the cloaking thing, but there's a child that isn't. But there's something else above it that looks to me like an adult with a child on its shoulder reaching into the adult's mouth. And like us, they probably ain't got a lot of teeth when they're little. They got to come in, right? So. I can see where an adult would have to chew the food first, and then the baby reaches in the adult's mouth to get food to eat. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Whatever you have, send it to me, and I'll, I'll definitely throw it up on the side under the episode for sure. Oh, I've got pretty good stuff. Some of them are a little longer. I got this one where uh, I got a lot of whoops in it. First is me interacting with some of the females, and then there's like a couple minutes with more whoops than I've ever heard in my life. And then there's a part in it where I don't know if you can bring it out, but when I heard it, it's like, you're talking. Then it gets later in there where it's about a 45 minute one. And later in it, there's, uh, you know, the males howling with the coyotes and stuff. I got a ton of that. A brother and sister who lived near Lake City, Tennessee, are hiking on a local mountain when they encounter a crouching Bigfoot that was somewhat aware of their presence. We were living in a little town in the foothills of the Smoky Mountains in Lake City, Tennessee, about 40 miles north of Knoxville. Many of us teenagers used to climb up to a huge house-sized boulder and hang out, hence the term, party rock. Late one summer, during school break, me and my little sister decided to go climbing. It was a lot different times back then. No phones, and we would be out from sun up until dark, walking for miles. Mom knew I would keep us safe as much as a 14-year-old could. Well, we walked the tracks for a mile or two and hit a trail at the base of the mountain. After a couple of hours of walking, we came to a fork in the trail, and even though I'd been there before with my older brothers, I took a wrong turn. After walking for probably another good hour or more, in 90-degree heat, the trail abruptly ended. Nothing but thick brush and a 45-degree incline of woods lay ahead. I told my sister that I'd made a mistake and we could easily walk all the way back or just head straight up from there. 
I knew enough that if we kept climbing up, looking at the daylight in the tree above, we would eventually hit the ridge line and the other trail. I could easily find my way back down to Party Rock. So we started trudging forward, grabbing saplings to pull ourselves up along the way. We stopped often to catch our breath and get our bearings and drink from the canteen, and we would often look down hoping to finally get the great view of our little town way below. But the woods were still too thick at that point. As we were slipping on old leaves and grasping for air, we reached a few feet of level ground in order to catch our breath. I'm not sure who saw it first, but as soon as I did, I looked over at my sister, and her mouth was already agape. I've gone over our account many times over the years, and I'm still not sure how we managed to stumble upon it. I don't know how it could have not hurt us, but maybe the birds were chirping up there, or maybe it had just got there. I don't know. But, I researched countless encounters over the decades, and I truly believe ours has got to be the best one ever. And here's why most encounters are a brief, fleeting glimpse of one, crossing a road or peeking at them, possibly throwing rocks or stones. This Bigfoot was completely unaware of our presence. My sister immediately whispered, Bigfoot. But me, being the big brother, tried to calm her fears and not show mine by saying, it's probably just a hiker enjoying the view. We both turned around and thought, what view? Now we were in the middle of nowhere, completely off any semblance of a trail in 90 degree heat. No way that was a person in any suit. They could have sat up there for a hundred years and never ran into another person. As my mind was racing, all I could do is stare. I've grown up hunting, trapping, and camping. I was proficient in biology and art, so I know what animals are supposed to be in certain areas, what they look like, and how to draw them. This was no bear, mountain lion, bobcat, or even a feral wild man. All were ludicrous answers people would give me. As we stared at it, I noticed it had no clothing. It was completely covered in long, reddish-orange-brown hair, except around the face. It was squatting, and as it looked to its left, my blood ran cold. I could clearly see it was not a human. It had more of an ape-like face and an unmistakable crown on its head, like a big silverback gorilla. It was reaching to its left to a bush and pulling leaves and branches off and bringing them to its mouth and eating them. I couldn't see if there were any berries on them or not, but it was clearly eating the leaves and all. We were so close we could hear the branches break and the sound of the bushes bouncing back. Periodically, it would act like it was coming up out of its squat, a little bit halfway standing, as it leaned side to side, craning its neck, trying to look down through the trees towards us. That was terrifying. Maybe he had caught an occasional scent of us, wafting up, or just sensed us. I don't know. My sister kept wanting to run, and I was literally too scared to run. I just wanted to close my eyes and wake up at home. After what seemed like an eternity, but was probably a good 10 to 15 minutes, I whispered, We run on the count of three. I barely breathed one, two, three. We spun around and started to sprint down that wooded mountain. I'll never forget that sound. We went from dead quiet to what sounded like a herd of elephants running through a bowl of potato chips. Looking back years later, I'm sure we scared the crap out of it, but not as bad as it did us. As soon as our feet hit the dry leaves and twigs, if there was ever any doubt, it let out the loudest, longest, and most god-awful roaring that lasted for five seconds or more. It was terrifying. I literally did a front flip, my feet trying to run faster than my capabilities. Plus, the angle we were running down was steep. We were so afraid it was going to head us off or snatch us up in the dry creek bed below. We ran straight through walls of thickets and thorns, sliding over 15-foot drop-offs. We were literally a bloody mess when we finally got home. My sister had lost my mom's watch and her shoe. I lost my machete and a few other things. As soon as we realized we were safe, the shock set in. She started throwing up and I started crying. We were both as white as ghosts. My older brothers believed us, got some guns, and went back up there. Sadly, I refused to go back in the woods for many years after that incident. My brother said it was easy to track us since it looked like a freight train had rolled down the mountain breaking trees and brush, and they were able to find her shoe and the watch. They asked us why we had ran right through the briars when there was a path that went right around them. I told them we didn't take the time to look for an easier path. We went straight down in order to get out of there. 
Near the end of the overnight appearance of anthropologist Dr. Jeff Meldrum and researcher John Bendernagel's discussion on Bigfoot on Coast to Coast AM with George Nori on September 26, 2006, an American who claimed to be living in the Ukraine telephoned into the radio talk program. The credible sounding individual had an intriguing account. Without disclosing his name, the man identified himself as an environmental scientist. He stated that after the fall of the Soviet Union, he was hired to do air quality studies at the museum in the University of Leningrad, St. Petersburg. While taking air samples in a three-level basement beneath the museum in 1992, he said he made a startling find. The American scientist stated that he came across an object in a glass case that, according to the label, was an animal that looked like a Bigfoot, taken near a Russian outpost in Northern California. The outpost was near Mendocino, and the mounted hominid was collected in the late 1700s, from what he could tell by the museum label. The huge animal had several layers of skin, exhibited a foot 17 inches long, and it was 7 feet 1 inches tall. It was basically a hair-covered, upright, Bigfoot-like creature. Could the supposed Bigfoot have been collected by one of the first surveying Russian exploration parties? Then there's the case of the Minnesota Iceman. A purported man-like creature, frozen in a block of ice and displayed at fairs and carnivals in Minnesota and Wisconsin in late 1968. Two strained scientists, Ivan Sanderson, who was also a naturalist, and Bernard Hovelmans, also a researcher and the founder of cryptozoology, examined the Iceman and concluded it was a genuine creature, noting putrefaction where some of the flesh had been exposed from the melted ice. Hovelmans wrote a scientific paper about the Iceman and even named it as a new species with Neanderthal affinities, Homo pungoides, and theorized it was killed in Vietnam during the war. When the Smithsonian Institution was reportedly interested in the Iceman, Dr. John Napier was asked to investigate. He suggested that the FBI investigate due to reports that the creature had been shot and killed. Shortly thereafter, the Iceman disappeared from public display withdrawn, Hansen said, by the California-based owner. In a 1995 interview, Hansen reported that, I never did find out if the Iceman was genuine. Ivan Sanderson, who had examined the creature, described the hominid. This author's personal opinion about the precise identity of this specimen is at the moment not formulated. As a trained zoologist, and one who has spent many years collecting mammalian and particularly primate specimens for examination, dissection and preservation in the field and while fresh, we would not presume to make any definite pronouncement upon anything other than purely generalized, overall description of its external appearance. The corpus must be freed from its ice encasement and properly examined first. However, some speculation as to the taxonomic status of this creature, if it finally proves to be real, is perhaps permissible, since we do not have detailed measurements and photographs to back it up. Bernard Hovelmans also contributed to the article, but he determined the body represented the fresh remains of a Neanderthaloid human, and he named it Homo pungoidi. Over the years, many skeptics, especially creationists, have simply labeled the Minnesota Iceman as a hoax and a product of Hollywood and atheist. Maybe the Iceman cadaver will turn up one day, with enough tissue intact for a proper forensic examination, though that seems unlikely. There were reports in 2004 that the Iceman was buried in an undisclosed and unmarked grave in a California forest. The lack of tangible evidence for the cryptid's existence may also be due to the theory that has been gaining popularity over recent years, namely, that Bigfoot is a non-terrestrial being. A few months ago, I posted a poll that posed the question, what is Bigfoot Sasquatch? To my surprise, 26% of the 574 participants answered they believed this creature was an interdimensional or extraterrestrial being. Are we at a point where people are open-minded enough to accept that a hominid species may very well not be of our time or our planet? Cryptozoologist Nick Redfern referenced a woman named Jenny Burroughs, who had a remarkable tale about a creature she claimed to have encountered in a particularly dense area of a Seattle woodland. Nothing less than a fully grown, saber-toothed tiger. According to Jenny, she had been walking through the woods with her pet Labrador dog, Bobby, when it suddenly stopped in its tracks, whined loudly, and dropped to the ground, shaking. Thinking it had possibly had a seizure, 
Jenny quickly bent down to comfort her pet, and could then see that the dog was staring intently to its left. Following the gaze of the dog, Jenny was horrified to see moving in the undergrowth what looked like a large cat, like a mountain lion, but much bigger. The fact that the creature was possibly a mountain lion filled Jenny with dread. However, that dread was amplified to stratospheric proportions when its face could clearly be seen, including the two huge teeth that were the absolute hallmark of the saber-toothed tiger. As Jenny said to Redfern, with much justification, you don't have to work in a zoo or a museum to know what a saber-toothed tiger looks like. Everyone knows. It was then, however, that Jenny's story became even more bizarre. As the cat loomed fully into view and out of the confines of the bushes and undergrowth, she could see that its body seemed to be semi-transparent and that the bottom of its front paws were missing. Jenny concluded that what she was seeing was not a still-living saber-toothed tiger at all. Rather, she thought, it was the ghost of a saber-toothed tiger that was haunting the old pathways and hunting grounds, thousands of years after its physical death. Could it be true? Are ghostly creatures really roaming our planet? Perhaps the idea is not as far out as it might seem, though it is likely that this may have been a residual spirit of a once-living creature. It may also be a manifestation of a non-terrestrial or interdimensional being. Our world cultures possess thousands of cryptid and humanoid legends that have been told for hundreds, maybe thousands of years. Is there a chance that we are chasing real entities that slip in and out of our plane of existence? I was told of the experiences of a well-known veteran Sasquatch investigator in the Sierra Nevada mountains who stated that he was watching one of these creatures walk away from him and it suddenly disappeared. The terrain did not offer cover or camouflage, and there was no direction that the creature could have taken without being seen. There were no caves or holes for the Sasquatch to duck into. It just vanished. Cryptozoologist Jonathan Downs of the Center for Fordian Zoology first coined the term zooform in 1990 and maintains that many of these phenomena result from the complex psychological and sociological phenomena and suggest that to classify all such phenomena as paranormal in origin is counterproductive. Thought form may be understood as a psycho-spiritual complex of energy or conscious manifested either consciously or unconsciously by an individual or a group. Thought forms are understood differently and take on different forms. Paranormal entities and anomalies have been known to manifest from minds of victims based on the current physical and social conditions. These thought forms are the prime element of poltergeist hauntings. S.A. Robinson, a self-described armchair Bigfoot researcher, states that it's understandable that a subject as odd as this one, with the supposition that there is an enormous hairy creature that lives in the forest around the country, without being clearly photographed, videotaped, or fully understood, should attract a great deal of divisiveness and infighting. When the proponents of the flesh and blood camp mix with those who favor the magical explanation, it can sour both sides from the real objective, which is to prove conclusively this entity's existence. The principle of the simplest explanation usually being the correct one stands up in terms of building theories, but it should not be used as an arbiter between two opposing theories, and so we are left with the two camps. Robinson continues to explain that because of the similarities between our current understanding of the UFO phenomenon and the fact that Sasquatch, the fleeting visual aspect, the high strangeness, and with lack of much physical evidence, not to mention the seeming invulnerability of both phenoms to physical attack, the link between Bigfoot and UFO encounters must fall into a similar category. Why, in these modern times, with so much technology, do we not have a full accounting of everything in our animal kingdom? Some will cite the case of the coelacanth fish as evidence of the evolutionary throwback that due to its extreme habitat was thought to be extinct until it was brought to fresh, modern speculation in a fishing net. To suggest that Bigfoot falls into the same explanation is to say that we have not really looked deeply enough into the woods. I refute this suggestion, as we have the ability to see nearly every square foot of the planet in high detail from space using satellite technology. We have a military-industrial complex that can ferret out any heat-producing organism of human size or larger with FLIR-equipped cameras. Despite the large tracts of uninhabited land on the North American continent, 
Humans have traipsed on so much of it over the past 50 to 100 years that we've compiled perhaps several thousand decent eyewitness reports of weird footprints, strange sounds and sightings of the giant, hairy, extra-human entity. A reader stated that just because we don't understand how Bigfoot move in and out of another dimension, or what their purpose is, doesn't rule out this possibility. He has questioned a variety of people that channel interdimensional beings, and every time the answer turns out that Bigfoot are indeed interdimensional beings as well. There are many other beings that can move in and out of another dimension, including fairies, gnomes, sprites, and others. Indigenous people worldwide will verify this, as they have strived to maintain and keep their connection to the earth and other natural beings, while the civilized world has nearly completely lost touch. Only young children and intuitive adults are able to see and feel these beings as they move in and out of other dimensions. It's time for us to wake up to the possibility, regardless of what conventional wisdom and science has to say about the matter. The evidence is there, and it's time to become more open to a broader perspective. Well-known paranormal investigator John Eric Bechard's theories sum up much of the argument. He believed that Bigfoot and similar cryptids may be interdimensional beings that can occasionally take physical form for brief periods of time, but have the ability to fade out and pass through wormholes, possibly to other dimensions or parallel universes. He reported to have had one of these creatures speaking to him telepathically, communicating the words, We are here, but we're not real, like what you think is real. Bechtrud claimed that such entities may be able to actually disappear into thin air or even shapeshift. Bechtrud maintained that the interdimensional hypothesis may possibly, if proven, explain why there are thousands of alleged Bigfoot creature sightings each year, yet no dead zoological physical body is ever found. To evidence these ideas, Bechtrud accumulated a large collection of enlarged photographs that he says show, among other things, half Bigfoots, invisible Bigfoots, are possible aliens. The forms are often found in situations where the camera picked up images not seen by the witnesses, often due to distance. According to Bechtrud, these images show primates, carnivores, and beings not readily identified with known zoological classifications that resemble descriptions of aliens submitted to investigators. He conducted much field work, such as camping out at window sites where, he said, Bigfoot activity is frequently seen. He collected his own photographic evidence of what he believes to be a tribe of other Bigfoots or aliens at the El Dorado National Forest. Bechtrud's strong beliefs about Bigfoot and similar entities brought him into conflict not only with skeptics who consider Bigfoot sightings to be a cultural phenomenon, purely resulting from wishful thinking or hoaxes, but also with those who believe that Bigfoot is an actual physical creature. Researcher and author Kiawani Lapsaritis maintains that the Bigfoot race was brought to Earth by star people long before human civilization. His evidence is the creature's use of telepathic communications, alleged hundreds of joint Bigfoot UFO sightings going back over a hundred years, and theoretical physics. He has also stated that the conventional Bigfoot investigators have not found the creature because they are limited in their beliefs that Bigfoot is simply a relic hominid that never became extinct. That really may be true, Lapsaritis said in an interview. But in addition to that, Bigfoot may literally be, as I discovered, a paraphysical, interdimensional, native people that have told me and other people telepathically that they were brought here millions of years ago by their friends, the Star People. In 2009, I received a telephone call from a woman in British Columbia who said that she was the daughter of a Kutane shaman. She stated that most native tribes seem to believe Sasquatch is a non-physical creature. Some tribal elders mentioned that they've seen the creature shapeshift into a wolf. She said that her father thought that the creatures lived in another dimension from our physical plane, but can come here as it wishes. He also believed that Sasquatch had great psychic abilities and that the creature can be visible to some people, while at the same time remain invisible to others in the same group. I recall a story that was told to me several years ago by another researcher. During an investigation, one or two of the witnesses offered details of an encounter that he was investigating. The information demonstrates several facets pertaining to the possible paranormal Sasquatch. On one warm summer's night, three teenage girls had gone to visit another friend. Her parents were out of town, so the girls planned to watch TV, play music, and have a fun, enjoyable evening. 
During the night, their discussion turned to horror movies and the paranormal, so the four girls decided to try out an old Ouija board. None of them were frightened by the board or the possible implications. In fact, they had no real idea at all or even how to use the board, apart from what they had seen on TV or what they had read. However, what initially started out as nothing more than a bit of late-night fun quickly changed into something much darker and much more terrifying. Using familiar television imagery, they removed a wine glass from the kitchen cupboard, placed the index fingers of their right hands atop it, and soon they were working the board. There were questions about boys and when they would marry and attempts to contact dead relatives followed, all to no avail. However, something decidedly odd did occur. On two occasions, the electricity went off, which scared the living daylights out of all four of the friends. One of the girls explained later, When that happened with the electricity, we all kind of looked at each other funny and decided to stop. It was all too late. The damage was done and the doorway was unwittingly opened. Nothing further happened that evening. The host girl, whose name was Laura, can't explain much of what happened as the next day progressed and the afternoon became early evening. Once again, the electricity failed around 6 p.m., and the dark, foreboding feelings began to take over even stronger hold on Laura's mind. She decided to retire to the comfort of, and what she thought was, the safety of her bedroom. Later that night, Laura was awakened from a deep sleep in the early hours and she heard what sounded very much like a loud yet disturbing animal-like scream emanating from the vicinity of a small but densely packed area of woodland that was situated at the rear of the family home. Cautiously but curiously, Laura got out of bed and went to the window and peered out into the darkness and the shadows. Nothing out of the ordinary could be seen, so she returned to the bed and was soon asleep again, but not for long. It was approximately 2 a.m. when Laura was jolted from her slumber but what she describes as the grossest smelling thing ever, like an old rotting cabbage. Laura put out her hand and turned on the lamp that sat near her bed on a small table. She was horrified and panic-stricken by the sight of a silhouetted, large, black, hairy figure that was partially eclipsed by the shadows in the darkened room. Laura said that the creature was hunched over and huge, with long arms and big white eyes. She added that at that very moment, she tried to scream out loud, and she experienced a sudden feeling of paralysis. I was sitting up, but couldn't speak or move at all, she stated. The worst was still to come. The hairy giant slowly moved in Laura's direction, stooped over her, and brought its face within eight or nine inches of hers. The creature was, Laura explained, just like a Bigfoot, a big hairy thing that I couldn't tell if it was an ape or a hairy man. For several moments, the giant bee stared intently and deeply into her eyes, and then slowly and carefully backed away, until the point came where its dark mass was almost indistinguishable in the shadows that dominated the room. The strange form ultimately disappeared. Laura recalled, like it had been sucked into the shadows. Notably, Laura added that although the beast had certainly scared the wits out of her, she did not get the feeling that it was being directly hostile. Instead, it was her opinion that the creature had appeared to warn her not to get mixed up with ghosts and Ouija boards again. Unsurprisingly, since that day, Laura has not. And the beast has never returned. Now I wonder, what would a traditional Bigfoot researcher say about that story? Maybe we'll discover beyond a doubt where the truth lies in reference to Sasquatch. We may actually kill several birds with one stone if or when we do find the answers to our questions. There may be a grand connection between all the mysteries in our world, possibly involving other worlds or dimensions as well. Mankind may be the greatest mystery of all, and the reason why Sasquatch, extraterrestrials, and spirits seem to be as fascinated with us as we are them. While many cryptozoologists and cryptozoology supporters find these theories ridiculous and often laugh them off, we would all do well to remember that the so-called mainstream of science has much the same reaction when presented with the possibility of Sasquatch existing at all. If we hope for mainstream scientists to keep an open mind, we must lead by example and not waste time and energy that would be better spent searching for evidence, fighting amongst ourselves. James R. Harnock, Cryptozoologist. Well, I hope you all enjoyed that. I certainly did. Again, the link to Brian's website, 
is in the description below. Go to his website and you'll find links to all of his podcasts on that website right on the home page. Otherwise, thank you for listening and we'll see you guys on the next one. Thank you.